And the answer is this. Think how profound it is. If mutations can occur as a result of adapting, then mutations are not necessarily random. And if mutations are not random, then evolution wasn't an accident. We didn't get here by accident. We got here by program. The relevance of this is that we actually got here through a process of creation and evolution simultaneously occurring, that the organisms were pre-adapting to the environment and the signals in the environment were shaping the organism so that evolution was not an accident. Well, of course, conventional religious, you know, they, we went from religion, people wearing black coats, the new religion, they wear white lab coats, but it's just as much a religion as anything else. And the bottom line about that belief <laughs> is that when we question the belief, everybody, oh, what do you mean energy healing? Ah, oh, that's heresy. What do you mean changing the genes? That's heresy. The truth is, no, it's called science. But science has a conviction to hold the truth, especially as the pharmaceutical industry, again, is trying to impress upon us because they're selling us a lot of things. So the bottom line is this. What does this say? Well, this paper, uh, let me explain. The paper that Cairns' paper came out in 1988. That was over 12 years ago, okay? This paper in Scientific American is in 1997, so that was nine years after. Point about this paper. I have to read it for you because you won't be able to read it. I'm gonna, and I'm going to use my theatrical. I'm on a stage, so I'm going to read it theatrically. It says, evolution evolving. I, here's my theatrical part. New findings suggest mutation is more complicated than anyone thought. First line. Nine years ago, John Cairns. And the point was, new findings nine years ago? Where have these guys been? And the answer is this. For nine years, they consistently tried to undermine Cairns' findings. For nine years, they did that. When this paper was published in Scientific American, they're not saying that Cairns was right. What they're saying is this. They can't seem to find another explanation, but they're still looking for it. Because the idea is, it appears to be right, but it can't be right. So, but now it's a few more years down the road, and now we have another understanding. So now I'm going to show you this. And this is out of Science, the journal Science. So I'm, it's not a chart that I'm making up. This is a chart out of the journal Science. This is the flow chart of information before Cairns. This is the Darwinian flow chart. How does it work? It says organisms at the top mature, and they mate. They create variants. So let's say two dogs. Two dogs at the top mate. They make a litter of puppies. The puppies are all variants of, of the parents. That what happens is, we also know there's a runt at one end of the litter and there's the bulldog one at the other end of the litter, so there's a range. When the puppies have to leave the litter and they have to go out and fend for their own lives, what's going to happen to the runt? Is it going to make it? No, it's not going to be able to survive. It won't be able to compete. So what happens is nature selects the strongest one to survive and gets rid of the weakest one. That's what selection is all about, natural selection. So it says this, that the, the, those that are capable of surviving mature start to cycle over again, that all the variations arise in, in the part of the reproduction phase, which is the belief is when the DNA gets altered. Now, I'm going to show you the new flow chart based on Cairns, and it becomes very relevant for this reason. Let me first explain it before I show it to you. You see the box variants? I'm going to show you in the new chart, it's on the right-hand side, but there are three variant boxes. So it goes organisms, variant, 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 selection, and I want to talk about those first. So let's take a look at the chart. The chart is this, organism, and there are three variants, genes of DNA metabolism, genotype variation, phenotype variation selection. Let me explain what they represent. Phenotype variation. Phenotype is the physical expression as you see it. So your phenotype is how you look physically in the world. Genotype is the underlying genetic code that programs for this structure. The box on the top, there's a new name for it. So let me give you the new name because it makes much more sense. The box on the top is not called genes of DNA metabolism anymore. There's a new name. It's called genetic engineering genes. What did they find? That in every nucleus, in every cell in your body, you have genes whose function it is to rewrite the other genes if they encounter stress. So the significance is, then you're capable of rewriting your genes. But here's the most important part. What was not even included in the other chart, but is now included, and it wasn't there before? And the answer is, these two boxes right here, the environment and organisms' perception of the environment. Look where the arrows go. 
What can the environment do? We'll follow the arrow. It goes up, across, number six and number five. What does it say it can do? The environment can cause the genetic engineering genes to rewrite your genes. Number two, they can change your genetic code. That's what it does. Now here's the important one. Organisms' perception of the environment. What can it do? It can rewrite your genes, number four, or it can change your physio physiological body to respond to the environment. What's the relevance of all this? Well, the environment was never even included in conventional biology. Now the environment is found to be very important, and more so, remember the slide I showed you about perceptions and belief? I overlay the top, and look. Organism, environment, that's the slide we showed, is the environment. Organism's perception. We said perception is belief. And what does it affect? The cells. In what way? By rewriting the genes and changing the structure of the cells. The bottom line is this. Your belief in a stressful situation will rewrite your genes to accommodate the stress. And the relevance about that is that if the if a stressful environment is something that's not even real out there, you will change your biology to fit what you believe. And the issue is this, then specific organs and specific tissues of the body are connected to the beliefs. There's a great book by Louise Hay called You Can Heal Your Life. There's a glossary in the back, and she's done great research to reveal that specific stresses affect different portions of your body. And as a result, if you understand which portion of your body is affecting the stress, then you can deal with it by understanding what emotions are eliciting that stress. And I'll give you, an, you know, it's just, it's just very critical to understand this, is that the, the symptoms of your body are your, your body telling you that you're under stress. That's clear. But the point about it is your body is trying to tell you with a symptom, deal with the stress. Because if you're not dealing with it, we're going to have a problem in here. And here's the interesting point. When we go to conventional medical care, what do they do with the symptom? They cover it up. And so you don't feel anything anymore. You know what the analogy is like? Because this is true. When I was working in graduate school, I was working in a, in a Chevy dealership uh, to make some money. And uh, Friday afternoon, all the guys had cleaned up their tools. The shop is ready. To, you know, everybody's closing up. It's almost 5 o'clock. Everybody wants to go home. And this woman came in, and she had been in a couple of times before. This is her third trip. For what's the issue? She came in because the little light on her dashboard says service engine now keeps going on. And she got very upset by this. And she's like, I brought in three times. She started to go through all the stuff. So one mechanic, brave guy, says, I can fix it. So he takes the car to the back to the bay. He gets inside the car. He goes under the dashboard. He pulls out the little light bulb. And then he has a smoke and hangs out. Why? Because obviously it takes a long time to do this work so you can charge him, you know? And the bottom line is, after about 20, 30 minutes, he brings the car back out front and says, it's fixed. And the woman got in the car, and guess what? She was happier than anything could be. She drove away. The damn light didn't come on again. <laughs> the problem is this. When we go to rid ourselves of symptoms, we are pulling the light out. The symptom is just the information that something is going wrong, that if you cut off that information about the symptom, you're telling the body, I'm not listening to you. And what's the body going to do? It's going to find another way to bring you some more information, but the next time it's going to be worse news than it was the first time. And the issue is this. Symptoms are telling you that you're not running in a coordinated fashion with your body, and that becomes important. So we want to now go this, and this is a very important section for me to get into. This is a, a section on conscious parenting, and it's based on this. This is the conventional law. This, remember I talked primacy of DNA a long time ago, first talk, right? I said that the flow of information goes from DNA to RNA to protein. And that means that all information is downloaded from the DNA. That's the conventional understanding. But we also now know that we now know information goes backwards. The first guy to find this was Howard Temin in 1960. He suggested that RNA could send information back into DNA, the reverse flow. And everybody said, oh, you're crazy. Again, he was a heretic. Why? Conventional religion said information only flowed this way. Well, he came up with it, and he said there's this thing he found called reverse transcriptase, an enzyme that takes RNA and codes it back into DNA backwards. Today, we all know this word because this is the AIDS virus. It really does exist. Even though they call him an idiot and a lunatic and all that, he got the Nobel Prize for it. 